The idea really was to look at cultural expressions of beauty. I'm obviously American, and I had been making sculpture looking at sort of female iconography in art, very classical expressions of female beauty. And at a certain point I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting to look at a different culture and how that culture expresses their ideas of beauty? So I went to Japan. So all the work you see is inspired by a seven month experience in Japan, looking at women's life, women's dress, um, and the sort of idea of beauty. I was on a fellowship that was provided by the Japan-US Friendship Commission, which is an exceptionally generous but completely unstructured experience, which means they basically just give you the money to live for seven months and you have your sort of vision of what you want to do, but you create your own resources in realizing that. So I settled myself in Kyoto in Nishijin, which is the kimono making, traditionally the kimono making district. And in my neighborhood were all of the workshops. And I thought, well, if I just walk up and down the street and poke my head indoors, you know, I'll meet the right people. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. I went with the idea of studying the kimono, but that really became a vehicle by which I studied broader aspects of Japanese culture. Um, and the people I met and their interests really started informing my experience there. Well, it's cast glass, so it's an unusual or not a common material for casting. Um, most people are familiar with bronze or iron in terms of casting, but this is glass that has been mold formed um, Basically what I do is I build a, a pure wax positive um, and form a mold around that, what's called a refractory mold. Okay. Um, and the wax is melted out and the glass is melted in. So it's a very simple, perhaps 5,000 year old process. Um, it's just, you know, the, the, the distinctive things are the pieces are large yes. um, and they're complex. So that's what makes the casting challenging. Complex for the viewer or complex to do? Now I'm speaking just technically. Okay. Um, complex, complex to do. You know, there's a lot of variation from thick to thin. Um, and that makes... Would you point that out to us? Um, so here, like this area is quite thick, you know, maybe 10 inches, 12 inches thick. And then all in the same segment, it's up to here, you know, one less than an inch. Um, and so that variation um, from thick to thin is difficult to achieve in glass. Glass naturally is an insulating material. So as this piece is cooling, it's cooling very slowly. Um, and the reason for the slow cooling is waiting for these thicker yes. areas to even out in temperature with these thinner areas. These pieces, they, they look ethereal. They, yes, you know, they, do. they look almost as if they've never been touched by human hands, you know, almost like an apparition. And I love glass for this reason. You know, it's almost otherworldly as it comes down. But the physicality of actually making it, you know, the pieces weigh between two and 500 pounds. Oh. <laughs> yeah. when, we're, when we're loading the thought. molds into the oven, yeah. it's loaded with a, a forklift, you know. Um, the glass comes from an industrial supplier. You know, everything is so muscular in the making, but the result is this sort of, almost like a breath of air, you know, it's so yes. simple. These are tomomboko boxes, um, and a Japanese person would be familiar with a much smaller scale tomomboko, because they, what they are, are, ceramic boxes that, uh, sorry, wooden boxes. boxes that accompany ceramic pieces. 
Um, for example, all of the objects from tea ceremony, each object has its box. And the box often has calligraphy on it that could be put there by a, an owner. Um, and you know, these are, these are historic pieces and they're highly valued. So, um, you know, I saw one, one tea bowl box that was owned by a famous poet at one point. And on the interior of the top of the box, he had written a small poem, poem. to the tea bowl. And you know, hundreds of years ago, and now that poem accompanies the tea bowl, you know, as it travels in its box, you know, nice. through time into the future. You know, so these, that idea fascinated me. And um, when I went to make some ceramic pieces, you know, after the Japanese experience, I had never worked with ceramic. But this incredible sensitivity to ceramics and this idea of the ceramic piece and the box, that really inspired me to make some ceramic pieces and also to make boxes that would accompany them. The story of the wood is funny. The ceramic pieces um, I made during a residency at a ceramic, um, the European Ceramic Work Center in the Netherlands. And I knew I wanted old looking wood. I didn't want to go out and get some pine boards and you know screw them together. So I went to a, a materials recycling place and these are actually boards that were used to age cheese. So if you look, you can see these circles and what they are from is the wheels of cheese were sitting on the boards <laughs> aging. <laughs> and um, you know, then I had, to, I had to assemble, you know, this is, this is one board, this is another. So I assembled them and constructed the boxes. After, after the ceramic work, um, I immediately thought there was a parallel in my mind between the celebration of impermanence in wabi-sabi and mano no aware and rusting metal. The ceramic factory in the Denmark was actually an abandoned brick factory. Uh -huh. And so I was around a lot of equipment that was deteriorating. And I thought, isn't that really beautiful in yeah. one way, you know? And so I had the idea to cast some kimonos in iron, but then intentionally rust them. You know, and everybody said to me initially, oh, you should work with core 10 steel. But oh. casting core 10 steel is very, very, very difficult. I forget what the temperature is, but you have to go to such a high temperature to cast it. So I found a metallurgist right. who was running a foundry in Italy, and he returned to a formulation of bridge, bridge oh. iron, yeah. And so okay. this is a formulation of iron used for, you know, those beautiful subway stops in Paris or, yes. you know, all of the bridges in Germany. So it's very durable long term and rust resistant. And what we did was we sprayed it with a combination of chemicals to inspire Sorry. the rust. Yeah. For me, and I sort of, I've thought about it a lot, um, the tradition of bronze is sort of an expression of everything that's stayed or established. You know, if you think about a culture, when we create a monument to something we value and we feel is important, we make it in bronze, right. you know. Um, for longevity. For longevity, exactly. Timelessness. Ceramic, because I literally um, was at a factory where they were taking the ceramic out of the ground. I think of ceramic for its humility. You know, it is really the most um, unassuming of materials. Every culture uses ceramic and every culture digs it out of, you know, their area of our planet, you know, and they just pick up some of the earth and then they form it. Um, the rust is, of course, for me, the impermanence. It has simultaneously an industrial um, reference and because it's, it's rusting, and decomposing ever so slowly, you know, probably over thousands of years, it does speak of impermanence. And then the glass for me is always this delicate balance between material, like it's, it is, you know, heavy and present and physical, but it's so immaterial because of its translucency.